This is Twit. Now, you know, you know a whole other ransomware that's going around out there. Now, people are talking about cyber insurance, cybersecurity insurance. And the question is, is it really a double-edged sword? I want to throw it to you guys. Who wants to who wants to jump into this one? Because I think, you know, a lot of you, you know, a lot of us have heard around the pandemic, had a lot of ransomware going around, and a lot of companies are trying to bank in, say, hey, I'm going to use cyber insurance to save me. Is this uh Curtis, is this you or is this is this cheaper? Yeah, let, let me let me take this one on because okay. I've talked to a number of different people, both the CISOs and risk analysis people at companies that uh, purchase cyber insurance and people from the cyber insurance companies. And, you know, it's the concept is clear. It's treating the risks of your IT and in some cases OT, but, but mainly IT resources, just like any other resource. So, you know, your data your application delivery chain, all of this is a resource just like your building, your furniture, things like that. And so if they can be damaged, if they can have an impact on your business, then you can insure against that risk. It works well, but there are, have been a couple of, we'll call them side effects, one that's not very good and one that's quite good. Now, let's talk about the not good one first. Criminals seem to have a very good idea of what the insurance limits for ransomware are, especially when it comes to smaller towns, municipalities, um, government organizations like school districts. And that's why, for example, in 2019, we saw a number of smaller towns in Florida and Texas, especially, hit with ransomware attacks where the ransom that was demanded came in right at or just under what their protection limit was from cyber insurance. And in those cases, the municipality or the school system would say, sure, I'll pay it because I know I can turn right around and be reimbursed from my insurance policy. So in this case, we had the sort of thing that was incenting ransomware at a certain level. You know, these did not incent ransomware that was a $5 million ransom because that was more than the, the policy limit. But there were lots of, you know, 10000 dollars $20,000 demands because they knew what the limits were. So that kind of, of interaction, that kind of dynamic is one that the insurance companies, the municipalities, law enforcement, all have an, uh, an interest in defending against. Now, the good side effect is one that, again, echoes what happens in the real world or in the world of, of hard assets. If you have a company, uh, let's say you have a small manufacturing facility and you want to insure that facility, the odds are nearly certain that you will get a visit from the insurance company. They'll walk around and they will identify places where you have risks. And in many cases, they will demand that you fix those, that, that you address those risk factors before they will underwrite the policy. And in that way, they actually improve the conditions within the physical facilities. Well, we're seeing the same sort of thing in cyber, where if a company wants to have an insurance policy, the, the insurance company will come and say, we want to look at your IT infrastructure. We want to see what your segmentation is like. We want to see what your policies are in terms of zero trust or authentication or identity. We want to know the kind of encryption that you're using and, and what the, the strength of the protection is at the cloud service providers where you're storing things. So all of that goes into actually improving the IT infrastructure 
of the companies that are getting insurance. Cyber insurance is now part of the risk landscape at companies of all kinds of sizes. And Brian, I, I want to turn to you first. Is this something that, that you think we really should have had for, for years? Do you, do you think this might have had a positive impact on some of the companies that have been hit by major incidents in the past decade or so? Well, obviously, we, we're talking about people learning from their mistakes. I'm going to go back in history, back into the 70s, and set my way back machine because Mr. Peabody's here. And I'm going to say, do you remember Banachek? You know, it was a great show about a private eye that went to go and find out about insurance issues, mostly insurance fraud. We need, I think, in our industry, the equivalent of Banachek for cybersecurity. You know, I, I put it in the same category as arson. If we were just going to insure an infrastructure, a building for arson, obviously, this now, obviously, people need to go and work with the insurance companies to make sure there are things like sprinklers or fire suppression or safe electrical systems and things like that, that people aren't using um, extension cords improperly. It's only really just starting to happen in the world of IT. We've got way too many people that it's, I got a brother-in-law with mad skills and that's fine. Um, but the problem is we, we have people going in that say they have the skills. They've got a great resume, but they're not got the experience. They don't have the certification. I, I'm not even sure I'd like the word certification, but they have the experience to go and secure their systems. Um, it's really not happening. And it needs to happen. The insurance companies, I think, need to get involved because they're hemorrhaging money due to ransomware. And it's just got to slow down. It's got to stop eventually. We got to start removing the low hanging fruit. And I think that's going to happen over time. But we need the education. We need people with the experience. And I don't know. It, it, something's got to happen eventually. Lou, you know, there's a lot of interesting things happening. What are you seeing? You know, the interesting thing here, I, I was talking to Curtis in the back channel here. I mean, one thing that a lot of these cyber insurance companies don't cover are things like, you know, BEX scams, like business email compromise scams. I um, mean, these are the this is the attack type of attack service where somebody, you know, burrows in, gets an email account or even creates their own email account or, you know, messaging account or so on on in a company's, uh, you know, interest in their on their network or whatnot, whatever. And they start sending out uh, data and, and communications in as if they were the company. Uh, and it could cause problems like they could, you know, they can exploit the company and they can, um, you know, and, and exploitation can sometimes be even worse for a company uh, or, you know, leaking their data that way uh, than sometimes ransomware. Because, again, it, you know, they can destroy the company's, um, you know, trust and trust in the company and so on and so forth. And so, uh, you know, these types of insurance programs, they don't cover all the different attack services. They're getting more sophisticated. Obviously, DDoS attacks and other things they can cover and ransomware. But some of the other ones that, that are harder to track and harder to audit are, are the ones that cyber insurance companies are not covering. And so the, you know, being able to pay for services that can help with that. Again, we just talked about advanced threat protection. I mean, obviously, this is part of that. Um, but again, there's a lot of other things that go along with it, obviously, because now you have phishing attacks and and uh, you know, other things that where now you're compromising your users, where your users are being the weakest link here uh, and they're leaking data. And they're, you know, obviously, we heard about the Twitter breach a while back. And, uh, you know, they're saying that, oh, wait, a customer service agent actually, you know, created the problem because they reset a password. And then that password then became compromised by another user who then used it to borrow into the systems. Well, OK, you know, is that covered? You know, because your own your own person uh, who wasn't trained well enough gave up the information that, that leaked, you know, that now let this this data leak and the account leaks. So I think that there's a lot of places uh, where there's, you know, where where we continue or we'll continue to find 
uh, where you know you can't lean on cyber insurance. Uh, it, it could be like like we said in the title, it could be a double edged sword. You could be leaning on it too much when in fact there's a lot hiding under the covers. Curtis. No, I, I think that this is one of those things where what we're going to see over the next probably two to five years is a continuing evolution of risk and insurance in corporate IT. I think that it will become far more normal to have a have the insurance company be a partner, you know, in the same way that we see Uh, Cloud service providers now as regular partners of enterprise IT, we'll see the insurance companies be regular partners of enterprise IT. I think that's probably good, especially because in the same way that we have managed service providers with security who can provide a level of expertise that many companies just can't afford, we have the insurance companies who are able to provide a level of risk analysis and risk remediation that most companies can't afford. It's one of those good things, but it's going to take us a while to get to that really good place. Fortunately, that will give us here at Twyatt something to talk about for a long time to come. 